the male and female Olympian, plus our alternates and our coaches all traveled to Italy and went to a World Cup, like right after the fact of making the Olympics, which was really difficult because I had so much emotion after being named to the Olympics that I, I really shut down. Hey everyone, welcome to The Rose Show. This week we have Logan Dooley, who is a longtime member of USA's Olympic trampoline team. I used to compete against Logan back in the day, and Logan and I have remained friends ever since, and he's even helped us work with some of the freestyle athletes through educational content and supporting our events. We will discuss his Olympic dream, what it was like to walk in Olympic open ceremonies, and Logan gives us his secret trick to competing under pressure. Stick around right to the end to hear Logan's thoughts on how to make trampoline more popular for today's crazy young athletes. All right, guys, let's go. Logan, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, thank you for taking your time. I know you're a busy guy with all the stuff going on and all the online coaching that you're doing to try to keep current. And uh, so thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Of course. Yeah, man. Well, tell people that don't know who you are. Tell our audience, who is Logan? How would you get into trampoline? What's your, what's your career path? Uh, yeah, so I actually started in trampoline when I was seven years old. Um, I got a backyard trampoline at the age of seven because I jumped on my parents' bed nonstop to the point where I kind of broke their bed. So they decided it would be much cheaper to buy a backyard trampoline than it would be to keep replacing the beds in the house. Um, so as a seven-year-old, I, I went out into the backyard. I learned you know, the basic front flip, back flip. Uh, and then obviously as a seven-year-old Logan, uh, the next logical progression was to do a double flip. So I started to learn some double flips in the backyard. Uh, my mom went outside, she got super scared. So she went to the local Yellow Pages, uh, found a gymnastics school that would teach trampoline. Um, and it ended up being uh, the, the place where I trained the majority of my career. Um, and underneath a coach called Robert Knoll, who ended up being the 2000 Olympian. Um, and that's really what what brought me into trampoline. The second I got there, I, I loved it. Um, got on the trampoline, learned things like twisting. And to me, I never thought that you could twist on a trampoline. Uh, I just thought you could flip. So I learned some twisting, was hooked immediately. Uh, obviously the first day I got there, I wanted to show my coach my double backflip. And coming from a, a self-taught uh, trampoline person, uh, my coach was like, oh my God, I never want to see that again. Um, but it was in my routine the very first time that I started to compete. So obviously he saw it again and it, I was hooked from the moment I started. That is really, really cool. Yeah, it must have been a transition. Uh, did you struggle with trying to clean up your freestyle form a little bit and try to get you, you know, into shape with a, more of an athletic kind of mind state? Um, I think that I was so young that I didn't really fully grasp all of that. Um, I just thought we were working on some fun different things uh, because as you learn different shapes and techniques, uh, they become more difficult, they become harder to achieve, which then kind of increases the difficulty and the, the focus and the wants uh, as you move forward. So I wouldn't say that it necessarily was hard for me to try to clean it up. I don't think that I was the cleanest kid going forward. Um, when I first started, I wasn't necessarily super clean, but I was allowed to learn those skills and also progress with some harder stuff. And obviously the, the more you learn, the more you're challenged, the less it feels like work, the more it feels like I'm learning new things. I'm, I'm cruising yeah. along. That's cool, that's cool. So, but did you want to go to the Olympics ever since you were a kid and you got enrolled or does that, you were just there to learn and then that sort of came later on? Um, I originally was there just to learn. Uh, so when I started, trampoline wasn't even an Olympic sport. Um, so trampoline became into the Olympics in 2000. Um, and I started when I was seven. So Olympics oh, were quite there. Uh, but I do remember one of my teammates, Jennifer Perilla, she went to the 2000 and 2004 Olympics. 
Um, and I remember watching her go to the 2000 Olympics and it was in the year 2000 that I decided, you know what, this is something that I, I want. This is something that I'm, I would look forward to. Um, and I think that I could do it. So it wasn't until later in my career, I was already a, a junior elite um, in trampoline before I decided that this was a path that I think I could take. So the star was is more fun. It got you had to get Robert did a really good job of kind of fostering that sort of love for just learning and developing. It wasn't really about the end goal at that start. It was just about little Logan just trying to get some fun and Robert helping him out a bit. Absolutely. That's nice. That's good. You know, I think a lot of people just need that sort of more let's learn and not focus just on the end goal right at the beginning. You know, sometimes you get w too fast into that. You just need to foster that love of the, the passion of the sport first and then, you know, get the results all that later. Absolutely. That's very cool. That's very cool. So when you did make it onto the Olympic team, what did you feel? Like when you finally hit the qualifying scores um, through your the actual qualifying competitions throughout that year and you knew, oh my God, finally I got it. Was it like an amazing moment or was it like dampened because now you actually had to go and throw everything down on the Olympic stage? Like what, did, what went through your head when you first realized you were going to finally see your dream? Uh, so a little bit of a background into that question. Um, I actually was an Olympic alternate for two years. So my first Olympic team that I made was in 2008. And then I made again in 2012. Uh, but I was the alternate. So I got to go to the Olympics. I got to see the Olympic stage, but I didn't get to compete. I didn't get to march out. I was just there as a reserve, ready to step in if, our, if the single Olympian from the USA got hurt. Um, obviously, that didn't happen. Uh, so when I came on for 2016, uh, I had this want and this desire so badly to be the Olympian. Um, and so when I finally, because uh, for those of you that don't know, it takes a whole year, it takes almost two years to qualify your country and yourself for the Olympic Games. Uh, so the year before the Olympics, your country has to qualify a spot. And your country qualifies a spot either through world championships um, or they used to do an Olympic test event that would qualify a few people. Um, but this year they moved on to a World Cup system. So they take an, a compilation of, of competitions and you need to place within the top X, Y, Z in order to qualify your country. So you first go through this round of, I need to qualify my country. We're a team. Everybody on Team USA needs to work together to get our country a spot. Uh, and so I had been a very large participant for the 2012 Olympics, um, as well as 2016 Olympics, uh, in qualifying our country. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've had that feeling of accomplishment as, you know, okay, I'm there, we've got the country, I'm ready to do this. Uh, but then you bring it back to your country and you have a, a different round of qualifications that your country sets. Um, and each country is slightly different, but for our country for 2016, they had three different meets um, that they were gonna count. And so how they were gonna place these points for these meets was the very first competition, they were gonna give you one extra bonus point for the final competition. So if you won the first competition, you were gonna go into the final competition one point ahead of everybody else. If you won the second competition, you were going to go into the final competition with five points ahead of everybody else. Uh, so how it worked out for me was the first competition I came in second. And so I had second place points. So I had like 0 0.5 points on everybody else in the competition. And the second competition I ended up winning. It ended up being my best competition of the year. Uh, so I went into the final competition with 5.5 .5 points ahead of everybody else. So on that final competition at nationals, I had to get out there. I had to, you know, obviously deliver. I knew that I was in a good place, but I still had to hit a 30 skill competition. Yeah. Um, and so I hit a pretty good prelims. The pressure was super on for the final. I knew that I already had this pretty big lead 
going in. Um, and so I still delivered a pretty strong routine, uh, but I ended up playing safe just because I knew that I kind of, I don't want to say I yeah. had it, but yeah. I, I knew that I didn't have to do my hardest routine ever. Uh, and so in order to not have like an outbounce or things like that, I decided to sub my finals routine instead of doing a Miller, I did a full, full straight. Other than that, I did my full routine, um, just to kind of play safe and make sure that I had a cleaner landing and then I could have those points at the end of the, the day. Um, and so once I landed that routine, I was like, was it enough? Like, did I, did I just make the largest mistake of my life or was it enough? And I remember there was one, Stephen Gluckstein was last to go up and I was just like, oh my God, like, was that enough? Did I, did I play too safe? Should I have done that, that larger skill? And I just sat and I paced and I paced and I paced. And I finally saw that score and I, I knew that my score was slightly higher and I was like, oh my God, I finally did it. Like, I finally feel like I've worked my dreams, my passion, everything I've worked for is finally going to be coming true. Um, I mean, tingly with just hearing about it. That's, that's really cool. So you, you started up being um, an alternate, which was kind of like almost halfway. It's just like, oh, you're, you're sitting at the table, but you're not allowed to eat any chicken or anything, right? And you're, you're there, but even though you still feel a lot of pride because you're, you have helped your country, right? It is a team yeah. effort. Right. So that still obviously is amazing. Right. But then finally you're like, yeah, you know, like you got the actual thing, but it's interesting to see how it builds, you know, it's that team atmosphere. And then there is that individual component, of course. But what I really liked about what you said that I think a lot of people who don't do trampoline don't understand. There's a lot of strategy playing. Can you give us a little background on the strategy that, um, you know, you use when you're trying to get the right scores for the right competitions and, you know, how that kind of plays into the dynamics of the, not just the world's best routine, but over time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it depends on the type of competition. So sometimes there's every other year they do a team year at the world championships. Um, and so you could actually win a world championships medal uh, just by being on the best place team. So that would mean that you would have three really strong competitors in your country of your gender. Um, so there would be three of you minimum, there could be up to four, but the top three scores count. So at the world championships, each country is allowed to send four participants in each gender and level. Um, so like on a team year, it's really important to have this most like the strongest, most consistent players that can come out because your country can still walk away with a medal, even if they don't place in the top three, because they have the strongest competitors. And so what they'll do is they'll take the top three from your country's strongest compulsory, the top three strongest optionals. And they don't necessarily have to be from the same people. Like you could have somebody that delivered a really good compulsory and somebody that delivered a really good optional, and they'll take those two scores and take your other two guys median scores you know what I mean so they'll just take the top scores um so sometimes the strategy will change depending if it's a team year or if it's an individual year um obviously when it's an individual year you're going full out you you know you're competing for yourself you're always competing for your country but at, in the hindsight you're competing for yourself because you're going for that individual medal um, but then there's also times where you look at, okay, I have a, a preliminary round, I have a semifinal round and I have a finals round. Like the world championships now does a semifinals because there's so many competitors. There's, I believe there's been averaging 120 competitors in the males division for almost every world championships, uh, within the last couple of years. Um, so in order to break it down from 120, to go to the top eight obviously that's really difficult so they've gone from the 120 to the top 16 from the top 16 to the top eight um and so there is just a little bit of strategy in between in between that um there's also a lot of strategy with the compulsory routine which as of next year sorry as of 2022 now with the the COVID-19 delay delay of the olympic games uh they will be getting rid of the compulsory routine 
uh, at the elite level, which is crazy. Um, wow. because that, that was my claim to fame. My compulsory always gave me that extra boost that I always needed. Okay. Uh, so now they're going to two optionals in the preliminary round, which I'm not even sure what that strategy is going to look like, but, um, uh, make it more interesting, engaging, more hard hitting. I'm not you sure. know, I think it's actually, it might be a little less hard hitting because I think they're going to, they're going to give you the opportunity to do two optionals in the preliminary round, and then they'll take your best one score. So you get two options basically to do. So it's kind of like uh, the X Games. You get a couple of rounds that you take the best, the best one. So it, I like that because that allows, instead of a one hit sort of thing and a one chance, you get to go there. You spend a lot of time and money and effort and energy going there. And it's not just all over all at once. So I think that's actually a really good strategy. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how that will pan out with, uh, obviously, how I've done my whole career is everything – everything counts and one mistake could be fatal. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting the most opportunities in. And if that means, you know, you've got to sub and make something cleaner. So you stay on, uh, because all 30 skills potentially are going to count for you. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. No, no, that was an amazing answer. Yes. And so when you now uh, make your routine, um, what's the strategy there? You, do you start high with the big skills, get them out of the way, or do you even it out? What's your thoughts on the best routine uh, development? Uh, so kind of choreography of the routine. Yeah. Um, I, usually like the, I usually start, I've started my routines with the triples. Um, I found that it's easier for me to connect the triples in a row as opposed to separate a triple and change the kind of, the, the momentum of the routine of going really, really fast to then slowing it down on a double. Uh, it worked for me to do, to keep the triples going in a row and then finish with my, my doubles. Um, I had a little bit of a trouble twisting, just a little bit. I could still twist, uh, but I found that flipping was a little bit easier for me. Uh, so I tended to end with the Miller straight, which is a triple twisting double layout um, because for me, it was a really hard skill. I see some guys out there now doing Millers in the middle of their routine, and they just do it so effortlessly. Uh, I think it depends if you're more of a natural twister versus a natural flipper. And for me, I was a little bit more of a flipper, so it was much easier for me to, to make those triples happen. But obviously, at the end of the routine, a triple would be really hard because you're just a little bit lower, unless you're a really good pusher. Um, <laughs> Squat, squat, squat. <laughs> yeah, so I like to do the triples, and then I like to do a little bit easier doubles for me, and then work up to those slightly harder doubles with a little more intricate twists, and then finish with a, a slightly simpler double to the hardest double I could do. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And can you tell for our audience that doesn't do trampoline, because we're, you know, we're kind of reaching out to all freestyle sports, giving a little bit of an insider perspective. Why does trampoline go from front skill to back skill, front skill to back skill on average? What, what is the strategy there? Um, the strategy of going front skill to back skill uh, would be that you could stay closer to the middle. Uh, so if you go front skill and back skill, obviously you're going to continue with that travel backwards just a little bit. And then you're going to go front skill and back skill and you're going to continue that travel just a little bit. So hopefully that travel is minimized to just be inside that box uh, so that you're working one side of the box to the next side of the box without actually leaving the box. Okay. Um, and so for those of you that don't know what an Olympic sized trampoline looks like, it's a, a rectangular trampoline. There is a larger box and then there's a smaller box. Um, and so then you get deducted for every time you leave that smaller box. Um, obviously it's, less deduction to get into the, to the larger box and an even greater deduction to get into the no box at all. Um, and that's actually designed for the safety of the athletes because they don't really want to see athletes getting so out of control that they're hitting the corners and the springs and then eventually flying off. Uh, so the strategy behind moving forwards and backwards is so that you can kind of keep maneuvering in and out of that smaller box just kind of going a little bit forward because traditionally a forward skill would travel forward slightly and a backward skill would travel backwards slightly. 
Um, and that's just the general emotion, momentum mm -hmm. and motion of it. So when you link two back skills, you're typically gonna travel backwards just a little bit further than you were. Um, so when you add that forward skill in it, it re-centers you back to where you just were. Ah, uh, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Yep, it's definitely simpler. I've played with the idea of just doing like the, in the compulsory, I don't know if you remember, they started going through this trend where everyone would do back tuck, back pike, back layout, because you can get the shoulders in the right spot easier. Um, mm -hmm. But then there, it was generally more travel when they sort of play with that stuff. So it's that back and forth balancing act. Let yourself go because you can't be perfectly straight. You're always going to lean forward based on basic biomechanics, you know, or backwards. So, and that's how you guys balance it out. Very, very cool. Very cool. And um, one final strategy question would be, what about scores? Like you have injury scores. And I know at least on Team Canada that there's ways that you could kind of you know, play with that to make sure that the right scores counted. If you got injured, you still got another year to be able to use that score for qualifying. Is that the same for you guys? Um, so are you talking about qualification onto a national team or? Onto any World Cup team from maybe from the junior to the senior when you got to get those right scores to kind of make it onto the, the team. Do you guys have injury scores as they call them? Uh, so in the United States, uh, we don't have injury scores, but we do have what would be, call, uh, be called a petition. Um, so typically, it's pretty straightforward. You, they set the boundaries for the year. You usually have like three tries to make a certain team. Uh, and those teams could be, you first have to get onto the national team. And then once you're on the national team, you can then be selected to go to other competitions. Uh, the national team still has a cap of the amount of people that are going to qualify. I think that probably has to do with financial reasons, uh, because once you hit the national team, then sometimes you get funded to go <laughs> to these trips. And so they want to make sure that they have the right funds to m ensure that everybody has an equal play. Um, so how it works in the United States is if you were on the national team previously or let's say you had a breakthrough competition and then you do get hurt there is a process called the petition process which would mean that you and your coach write up a petition and say look i hit this score at the first competition i hurt xyz and i couldn't participate in the next the following competitions but i feel like i'm you know a, a key player for you guys will you please evaluate my previous scores and and let me know what can happen and so then a committee that is uh voted on i think every four years i, I could be wrong um a committee would then look at that petition and then say you know what they're right they were really on the right track we we would still like this person to be a part of the team to be eligible for these other competitions uh we're going to give them a petition add in to the team or we're not. <laughs> so. Yep. It seems to be the same way we used to do it. I never really got any major injuries, so I never had to go through the process. But I know that there was always different ways and when you could submit it and this, that, and the other. And that was when I, I on the back end, you know, we heard some games being played to try to make sure that the right score was put in at the right time so i was just curious if that was happening for you guys but yeah it's it's very interesting all the different nuances of the sport that really just kind of go over a lot of people's heads because they just see people flipping around on a trampoline it's it's tough sometimes to understand so that's that's very cool thank you for that insider perspective and so moving forward, once you've now gone through all the, the trials and tribulations to get onto the team, you're now finally going to be an Olympic guy and you're actually going to be eating from the table this time. So <laughs> what, what, went through, what was the training like? Did you change your training? Was it just can steadily keep doing what Logan does or did you all of a sudden rev it up a notch knowing that this was your big shot? What, how did your, chain, uh, your training get influenced by your, your Olympic status? Um, so I really had, once I made the team, I had about a month uh, to really kind of focus on, on what I wanted to do and, and the routines I wanted to debut. And I went with uh, a little bit more of a conservative approach. So I decided that, well, collectively we decided, my coach, myself, uh, that I should be doing my 16-2 uh, in the preliminary rounds of the Olympic Games. 
that that would be the safest option, that I've had the most success with that routine, um, and that I shouldn't really try to debut something brand new and then, you know, not have it go exactly my way. Of course, of course. Um, but for, for us, after being named to the Olympic team, <laughs> literally the next day after being named to the Olympic team, they brought us to a World Cup. Uh, so right after being named to the Olympic team, all the Olympians, uh, so the male and female Olympian, plus our alternates and our coaches, all traveled to Italy and went to a World Cup like right after the fact of making the Olympics, which was really difficult because I had so much emotion after being named to the Olympics that I, I really shut down. Um, I needed just a, like a little bit of a break and a little time. I think it was one of my, yeah, I think it was that's one of my first competitions that I performed at. Uh, but I think my emotional level was just so high the week before that I just couldn't take the time to refocus quite yet. I now had this new expectation, like I'm Olympian, I'm going to be moving forward. And like, but my steam level was just so low. It was so much emotion put into that, that moment. Um, and then it was like, okay, well, thankfully that was terrible. So now I need to get my head in check and, and move forward and figure out how I'm going to push forward for the Olympic games. Uh, and so I had about three weeks of training before we actually flew down to Rio to start training. Um, and so Luckily, those three weeks were enough to kind of get me where I needed to be. But still, the emotions of training right before that, the Olympics, uh, even after you did the march in, there was still a couple of weeks before you actually competed. So you went, you did the march in, you're like, yes, you're celebrating, you're so happy. But then you're like, okay, like I really need to focus on my sleep. I need to focus on what I'm eating. Like some sports are now starting to be finished. Like their, their disciplines are starting to be done. So people are out celebrating, but I need to sleep. Like just, you know, ignore that and, and move forward. And, um, cause you're, you're in the Olympic village the whole time for the two weeks. Or yeah. So, for one week, just the week. Uh, so trampoline didn't, didn't, uh, go until week two, I believe. So we had, two weeks of being in the village um, since opening ceremonies, but the Olympics go on like a whole month. So you could potentially be in the Olympic village for a month, but uh, I had two weeks before we competed, um, which meant that there was two weeks of training uh, in a different facility. So we weren't actually training in the arena that you competed at. We were training in an offsite facility, which is pretty normal. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was good. Did it, uh, did training. It what? Did it mess with you that you had to compete and train in two different areas? Was it, is it tough on a general perspective? Cause I know that they normally do that. So is that tough for you to kind of get your head wrapped around the different environment or can you just shut it off? I, I think I'm pretty good at just shutting it off. Uh, I, it does take me just a minute to adjust to a new, new surroundings. Um, and for the Olympics, they, they gave us one day of, of getting into your surroundings. And then the next day you're actually in the arena. So they didn't have that trampoline in that arena for very long. Uh, and that's basically due to all the other artistic events and rhythmic events that are going to take place in the same arena because they just set the stage and tear it down and set the stage and tear it down. Uh, so we kind of went in between the preliminary rounds of artistic and in between the finals and their rest time. Then we had our uh, like three day competition. Um, and so leading up training was pretty good. Obviously, you, you have your days where you feel really good. And then you have your days where you're like, oh, I need to do more. Um, and th those still happen. And I think that a lot of people can understand that when the pressures come, you feel like, you got to do a little bit more or, you know, some days I was like, you know what, that was good. I'm, I feel prepared. I feel ready. Let's, let's do this. And then the day finally comes. And I remember just walking out to that arena and 
I literally couldn't stop smiling, like ear to ear. I was like, oh my God, I'm here, I'm doing it. It's finally coming true. To be honest, whatever happens next, like this was my goal. And yes, I wanna push forward. I wanna be the highest scoring American that has ever been, but this is my goal. I'm here, this is my moment. I'm gonna live this. And you know, I- That's awesome. That is it, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's because, and that's what I was going to ask you is, you know, how, how much was your emotions tied in with what you expected the results to be versus just the experience of being an Olympian? I guess you've already touched on that. that it was all just about getting that title and the rest was just extra. It's all gravy from there in a sense, right? Yeah. So I think one of my strengths as an athlete is I'm a performer. I like to get out. I like to show off. I, I love the eyes on me. It's, it's just part of me and part of who I am. I just really like that attention. I, I thrive on being able to show off and be up there and be out there representing. So when I walked out, literally just smiles on smiles. And, uh, you know, as, as I progressed into my Olympic performance, my compulsory was not the best compulsory I could ever have done. Um, it was still quite good. Um, and it was a little bit different structure for that competition. So they had the first eight come march out and then they did their compulsory routine. And then they had that, the first eight march out and the next eight come march out and do a compulsory routine. So you got to march out on that floor twice, which was great for me. I loved it. I loved every second of it. Instead of just sitting out there, you got to like march out and, and do it again. Uh, and then everybody else just sort of followed through. So I was in the first ring of the competition. I got to march out once. I had to march back out. They let us train in the back uh, if we needed more turns or whatnot, just because the length of the competition is a little bit longer. And then the next round came out and I got to march out again. I was like, yes, I love this. I love every moment of this. I'm going to take it all in. Um, but yeah, it was good. I ended up being the, the highest placing American that uh, USA has ever had. Uh, it was a very good accomplishment for me. Uh, I don't think that they were my best routines that I had ever done, but um, it, it was a, a good competition. I delivered. I, I performed what USA knows I am capable of performing on any given day. Uh, and I was, I was happy with the outcome. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. I'm just getting tingly just thinking about it. Because seeing just the happiness that you're reliving that moment, it's, uh, it's very infectious. It's very cool. Very happy for you. I really am. All right. So after everything was done, you competed well. You're happy with the results. USA is happy with the results. You go and basically get drunk as hell. Did you party? What happened? Did you fall asleep out of all the emotions that were running through your head and just clunk out? What, what happened right after? Um, right after, obviously it was a really big high. Um, I had some people come down to Rio to watch me. Uh, so my mom, my now wife, uh, a few friends had traveled all the way down to Rio to watch me. And basically up until this point, I really tried to stay really focused. Um, so I didn't really see them a whole lot. So my first order of business was to meet up with my family and my friends. And we, you know, I, I really hadn't had the opportunity to, to really be with them at all. So my first priority was to go find them and meet them. Obviously, once you finish, you, you go through this like interview stage where there's like, I forget what they call it. I think they call it the ring or something like that, where you, you walk in and it's all these interviewers from all around the world that just want a minute of time or whatever. I had a few people from my local um community be out there that knew that i was involved with a school called apprentice school uh so they they wanted to talk to me about being dyslexic and all this stuff uh but the second i was done with all of the official duties i went to go see my family uh we ended up going to a place called the p and g house uh which is kind of like a safe house for athletes they they put on a lot of uh so it's procter and gamble and for Team USA, they're one of the largest sponsors. So they, they have this house that you can you know, bring your family to and, and have a meal and 
and enjoy each other's company and it has all these cool different things like you can get laundry soap or free like all yeah all sorts of things i think we took like a tide picture and just okay. had fun in rio and it was down on uh, coco cabana uh the beach so we were like right on the beach we met up with everybody we had a good time uh i was obviously a little bit controlled still um tried to you know try to be a good boy hang out there uh but i know you trampoline guys and girls you guys uh, can party pretty hard after those national banquets and stuff i i know it's in you <laughs> might be in me but i i'm I'm so conserved. <laughs> that's good. Well, that's, and that's the funny part about trampoline. It's a very controlled, like your, your whole sport is about taking something that most people feel is out of control, flipping, flopping in the air, and you basically bring it down into a fine science and be able to nail it on the cross. It's, it's actually very cool. It's the epitome of control as far as I can tell. <laughs> that's cool. So then when you're, when you're seeing your family, you kind of get to catch up with them, hugs and kisses and all that. And then, Afterwards, did you get to stay in the Olympic Village for a while, or was it get on out and good luck? You know. Um, so this was a Team USA decision, um, and I believe it kind of happened with some of those swimmers that were on Team USA that got in trouble. Um, USA Gymnastics didn't want us to have the same type of experiences at the Olympics, uh, so they allowed us to stay in the village for an additional couple days. Uh, then they did ask us to leave the village. I did move uh, from the village, and then I, I went with my family. And then we did some non-Olympic stuff in Rio. Like, we went to the rainforest. We, yeah, we went and we saw this, like, beautiful waterfall down in Rio. We climbed Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, we went to a few different beaches and just sort of did the more Rio-type experience over the Olympic experience. Uh, but I did want to stay and I wanted to watch like all around our artistic finals. So we did have tickets to that event. So we, we stayed till then we watched that live. That was awesome. I did leave the Olympics maybe like a week before closing ceremonies. So I did not go, I did not walk in the closing ceremonies. Um, but yeah, I had a great, great experience down at the Olympics. Um, and then immediately Maybe two or three months after, uh, we started what the USA used to do. I don't know if they're going to continue this, but they had a, a tour of champions where all the gymnastics people, trampoline included, uh, goes on a 30-city a tour around the United States and performs at all these different places. And, and it really is a, I don't know, three-month, month, I, I can't even keep track of the time now. Uh, but it was a really cool experience to travel across the United States by bus, stopping at every major, not every, a lot of major cities and, and performing, uh, you know, cool. more gymnastic stuff in a really cool environment. It wasn't traditional. It was more artsy for sure. Uh, a lot of dancing, but it was a lot of fun. And so we got to celebrate and continue on the, the Olympic journey for a few more months after that. So you got to you got to stretch it out. That's cool. Got to stretch it out for a little while. Yeah. Hey man, that's the people. There's people that fight their entire lives that don't get that experience. You know, so you don't want it to live it down too too early. So that's that's really really cool. Okay, so then you go on your tour and you're still on your high and everything's good and you're having fun. And hopefully a little bit less pressure with the shows compared to the <laughs> Olympics, of course. Um, and then. You get back to the gym. What did you say after? Did you say, oh, I'm going to go for another Olympic series? Did you say, you know, I'll, I'll end off on top and I'm happy and I'll move on? What went through your head as next steps? Uh, that's a hard question. So after the Olympic, a total Olympics experience, you, you definitely have a high. And, and once you have a high, typically you've got to have a little bit of a low. Um, it's just sort of how the body can recover and, and return. I had told myself that I am 100% not finishing on the Olympic Games. So I did actually compete in the 2017 World Championships um, where I finally debuted a, a three and three quarter front. Oh, okay. Yes, I definitely scared all the judges in that competition. Um, but I was so, was so was close it? to finaling. Even with a huge mistake, because I scared them all, it wasn't my plan routine. I 
just had a little bit of the flipsy happen and um, recovered beautifully. It was actually a beautiful routine. I think I might have gotten hit a little hard for throwing the judges off just a little bit. Um, but I did a brandy ball out, out of it and did a really nice optional routine. Um, I thought it was good. <laughs> but I did tell myself I wasn't going to end on the Olympic Games. I did compete in the 2017 Olympic, um, I'm sorry, 2017 World Championships. Uh, after that, I kind of had to make a little bit of a decision because I was running the club. I have a lot of athletes under me that I've been coaching. My coach decided to retire after the 2016 Olympics. So for the whole year, I was coaching myself. And that becomes just a little bit hard. Uh, it becomes hard to get feedback, obviously. Uh, and it becomes hard to self-motivate. Uh, I do a pretty good job of self-motivating, but I went through one season and then I had to kind of make the decision. One of my athletes, Alyssa O, oh, was in a really good spot to qualify for the Youth Olympic Games. And I knew that it was a dream of hers for a very long time to qualify to the Youth Olympics. And with the Youth Olympics, it was gonna be kind of a month long experience, very similar to the Olympic Games where the, we're gonna live in the Olympic Village, we're gonna train, we're gonna do our stuff, and we're gonna stay till the closing ceremonies. Uh, but I had to kind of make the decision whether I was gonna step down from the national team or if I, and step up as a national coach. Um, they didn't really want me to be both. So I had to kind of choose whether I was gonna take the time to coach somebody that I had mentored for a very long time and coached for a very long time and help see her to her final goals, not final goals, but her very large goal, um, or if I was going to continue training for myself so that I could continue to make the World Championships team for 2018. So I decided I would step down from the team and step up as a coach. Um, and I never officially retired, so I still have the eligibility to get out there and do it again, uh, but I am coaching a lot of people right now and I am enjoying it a lot, so we'll see. So you've gone from a uh, G-tramp kid that's gonna die to then becoming a Olympic trampoline uh, athlete, obviously. And then once you kind of hit your dreams, you said, you know what, it's, it's not fair for me to kind of hog it over and over again. I have great athletes that are coming up as well. It's my duty now to pass on that Olympic dream to them. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think they, they have the same dreams, but it, it takes that extra, that extra push for somebody to accomplish those dreams. And so I think that it would be selfish of me to continue to push the same way and, and not give them the focus that they need, the, the focus that I required from my coach. So I agree. You're, you're a good guy, Logan. You definitely, you definitely are. And I, I, I hope more people can see that, you know, it's not just that oh, I have to win. It's everything behind it. It's uh, that attitude of just striving and helping your team strive and knowing when to step down and let someone else, you know, take the glory. And I, I, I think that's very nice. That's very, very cool. So where do you want to go with this in the future? So you're now more of a business guy. You're more coaching. You're running the club, all that sort of stuff. Where do, where do you go from here? Um, I mean, I think, I think the adventure just continues. Uh, with this sport, there are so many unique opportunities and so many unique different niches that people can get into. Um, I obviously, I love working with kids. I like working with teenagers and adults as well. Um, but I really have a passion for, for watching people learn and watching people understand. And it, it brings me joy when people get something and it, it finally clicks. They finally clicked with that new skill. They finally clicked with connecting this combination of stuff, or they finally clicked on figuring out how to clean it up. Uh, all three of those things, when I see people get, when I see people achieve it, bring me excitement. And I feel like once I have that excitement, they feel that excitement and it, it becomes a really good kind of rolling with, you know, mentality. So I really enjoy the, the coaching aspect of the sport. I definitely see myself in this sport for life uh, in one way or another. I don't think that I can get out and just be, be done. That's not me. Uh, I think I'm definitely a lifer in the sport of trampoline. So I'm currently you know, running a club. I run World Elite Gymnastics. We've had a lot of success. 
and I, I just see myself moving forward, trying to step up and, and work into different coaching roles within the United States. Um, I, I obviously love helping in any way. I'm currently uh, working with Wooly Trampolines, so trying to think of different things that, that can happen. Um, I'm still interested in doing shows and different things like this and getting that, that urge that I have to be a show off, you know, accomplished. Um, but I, I like fostering people and, and helping them try to achieve their goals as well. Um, I've enjoyed being a judge at the, the GT games and, and watching these young people with raw talent just show off their raw talents. Um, These kids are crazy. Yeah. The kids are I just, crazy. I want to serve the community well. I want to promote what has brought me so much happiness. And I just want to share it with everyone else. Very good, very good. Yeah, I think I think all, as you said, call them lifers. All of us lifers that have really just said, you know, this is this is our pathway in the sport, and this is what we're doing with our lives. You know, and I think I think they need that kind of passion, like what you're saying. It's it's not just you being on top. It's about building the sport itself and investing in the youth and all that sort of stuff. Because the youth is now they're kind of taking this in a whole new direction that we never really thought that they could and they're they're doing it to be honest more proficiently than I could have ever expected and uh it's very interesting to watch a little scary to watch uh, obviously you've been to the GT games so you know what kind of mentality we're dealing with but I, I think if we had a lot of coaches like you that really understood that it become it comes from a nurturing perspective you know and not just a results oriented that we can hopefully give these guys a great platform to do whatever it is that they do with the sport we don't know where they're going to take it but you know where they do it i'm i'm looking forward to it. i want to see what the future brings yeah absolutely me too and for our audience our younger audience do you have any mental tricks that you kind of play with when you're competing or about to you know be an olympic athlete for the first time and you are really there to do it what goes through your head how do you rationalize it how do you not break down because of the nerves is there any tricks you got um, so for me, um, obviously I would say play to your strengths. So everybody is different and everybody functions just a little bit differently. Uh, for me, I, I try to focus on what I'm really good at. Uh, and for me, I was really consistent. So I wasn't always clean. I wasn't always as, as a younger me, I wasn't always clean. Um, later in life, I was actually known for how clean my compulsory could be, but early on, I was a little bit scrappy. Um, but my strength was I was consistent. I could make 10 skills. Even if it wasn't the right 10 skills, I could usually make 10 different skills and stay on my feet. Um, and that was, it became a mentality. I told myself, you know what? I'm consistent over and over and over. I told myself, I have no reason to believe that I'm not consistent. I am consistent. I know I'm going to get up there. I know I'm going to give you 10 skills. I know I'm going to give you another 10 skill routine. It's just, I know this. I know this in my brain. It's who you are. You tell yeah. yourself, this is what Logan is. He is a yeah. consistent machine that, and that's your persona. So you give yourself a persona and you then deliver based on kind of that self uh, realization in a sense. Yeah, I mean, similar to, I mean, I don't want to guess, but how you, you branded yourself as like a crazy man. I'm going to jump off this highest building. I'm going to jump onto these airbags. Like I'm known for the crazy man. I'm going to give them what they know I am. I'm the crazy man. I'm going to do it, right? And you take on this persona. I told myself I'm consistent. I can do this. I can always give 10 skills. Like I just over and over, I, I proved to myself that I was consistent and then people reassured me that I was consistent and then I it was hooked I believed it I believed 100% I'm consistent and that's my strength I can stay on the trampoline like despite everything else that's where so a lot of people will say things like well you know you got it you can do uh, you know mental distancing from yourself you know talking in the third person you can do visualization but you wanted a little bit different strategy you said I'm going to basically create a persona that I'm going to live up to. I think that's very interesting. That is very, very cool. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of my mentality going in. Obviously, I wanted to be prepared. I wanted to train. I wanted to, to get the numbers behind me. I wanted to feel like I had done enough to be prepared.
but even if I wasn't prepared, I still created this, like you said, persona of, I know I can hit. And people say, oh, Logan, he's not going to fall. People said that. People said, well, oh. That's what know. I think. When I was watching, I always liked your lines because you always held your lines so much longer than everybody else. And it's, it, I watched your Rudy outs and it just, it looks so beautiful i'm just like oh my you know and that's and that's and you're right like when i think okay who's someone that never falls oh logan's going that there, there's a guy that's not gonna fall you know and mm -hmm. same with dong dong obviously you know but it's it's you become that character in a sense yeah and then later on in life people kept saying oh my god logan has the best lines logan holds his three-quarter front so well logan does a really good compulsory and again you hear this feedback and you're like you know what let me tell myself that feedback. People are saying it about me. Let, me. let me fuel my fire in a positive way. Obviously, you can take the negative comments and you can, you can fuel those too, but it's not going to help you, in my opinion. You've got to take what you, what you think you bring to the table and you've got to reassure yourself of those, of those qualities and those characteristics. And it helps if you have somebody that's there to, to help you on and to cheer you on and to be a cheerleader. Uh, but if you don't have it, you still, you know what you're efficient at and you've got to allow those things that you're efficient at to fuel you more than the things that people tell you you're not good at because we're all not good at a lot of things, but we've got to find those things that we're, that we can do, how we can, you know, work around our, our own obstacles, um, and, and move it forward. So I, I like to kind of, Relate it to to my school. So like I had a lot a lot a lot of trouble in school um, I'm very severely dyslexic. I still mix up numbers and letters and and Write letters upside down when I'm not thinking completely, you know, totally 100% focused um, And so that was sort of I think where I learned to try to play to my strengths because I, I couldn't read, I couldn't write, um, but I could remember. I could try to remember what people were telling me. I could relay a story. If somebody read me a story, I could basically remember the whole story. And, you know, and even when it was my turn to quote unquote popcorn read in class, I'd pull out my book and I would be like, okay, what do I remember from the story? And I would just start trying to remember what I'd remembered from somebody else reading me the story. So, you know, I could do that and I could fake it till I make it, but I wasn't actually doing it. I, I still didn't know. Um, obviously I've, I've matured and I've grown and I've learned and I, I can now, you know, read and write. But as a young child, I had to find ways that I could just re, you know, put, put, put forth my best effort and, and find out strengths that I had over other other things and, and play to those strengths. Otherwise the the ridicule of people telling you certain things is is pretty harsh. So you gotta focus on the positives and stay stay on the positive and and play to your strengths. So that's my mental strategy with a lot of life. That's a very good mental strategy. Stay positive because uh, otherwise life can get very dark. I, I agree hundred percent. It's very easy to focus on all the negative stuff and people tend to criticize you more than they applaud you. So just focus on your niche strength and make it work for you. Even if, if, even if you're a difficulty person, but you don't have the right techniques all the time and bad shoulder stretching or something, then you but own that difficulty then and make Absolutely. it. Yeah. If, if you're somebody that can do a lot of crazy flips, do a lot of crazy flips. If you're somebody that can work to perfect a single flip, perfect that single flip and let it fool you. If you're, you know, if you feel like you're the best twister in the world, keep twisting. Like, you know, it, the twists are going to add up to the flips. The flips are going to add up to the twists. Uh, if you're just perfect at all of it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Who knows on yeah, kudos. Yeah, if you're good at everything. Oh, man, I wish, I wish. I'm putting that in my letter to Santa for next year. I want to be good at everything. <laughs> okay, so for our final question here, for the future of the sport, since everything's been going so nicely for you, you're chugging along, you're going through, you're helping everybody else, 
where would you like the sport to go? Do you like where it's currently going? Would you like it to make a left turn or right turn? Is there anything you'd like to see more of or less of in the future that you think would really help the sport really just kind of pop off? Um, well, I think that I like how the traditional sport has progressed. I think that it is progressing in a, a good nature. Uh, I will be curious about the new rules that they're going to have coming up. Uh, just with allowing two optionals over a compulsory, I think that it might have a slightly backfired effect on on what they've created already. However, I do feel I understand where they're trying to come from. Uh, they are trying to make it, I'm not sure, maybe a little more forgiving. But then again, you move on to the final rounds and it's no longer forgiving. So it's I, I'm just not sure where it's quite going. I do like the direction that it's gone. Um, I like that they've increased, you know, time of flight and height and form and travel. And these are all now separate deductions for traditional trampoline. Um, obviously I think the sport needs to grow in numbers considerably. I think that we need a lot, a lot more people out there teaching trampoline, whether it's for a super competitive level or not. Um, we just need more people out there teaching and promoting trampoline uh, so that our numbers can grow. And once our numbers grow, I feel like it is a really intricate sport. And I think that it has a good potential to have a fan base. Um, and I feel like if the fan base can grow and we can get into more popular outlets and popular channels, which we are slowly like, like this, getting there, but it's just taking such a long time. Um, I think once we can get into those niches, I think people will truly be fascinated by the sport. There's just so many elements and so many intricate things that go along with the sport, whether it's just the development of it or the final picture. Um, I think there's a lot of interest that could be had because I have the interest. <laughs> I see, I see where it can be. And I feel like We've got to make that one last jump as to how to connect everybody with it. Um, and I think that it can be done through different things. Obviously, you need variety. You can't just be full 100%. Like, this is the only thing that's going to be pounded in, or it, gets, it does start to get a little dull as well. But I think with the combination of, of what's going on, I think there is a way to make this sport completely marketable and, and viewed on a you know, on TV or brought even into a college level where there's college competitions. Um, I think that all of those things could happen. And I think. What if you ended up doing something simple by just basically taking out the leotards and putting in more, let's say younger friendly clothing styles. Do you think that would hurt the sport because then you can't see the lines, you can't judge it as accurately but then it does open it up or do you make two streams, one that's a little bit more open and creative versus the you know, straight lace? Do you think that would have an effect or how do you think that they can reach these new markets? You know, I think that, I think the leotards do detour a lot of boys, um, especially it, it, it does. A lot of the younger generation, uh, they are kind of put off by it, but it's kind of the same thing with, diving right like diving is still a well a popular sport people watch it on tv they have it in college they're not in flattering outfits they're in a speedo they're in a bathing suit a one-piece bathing suit um i think a part of it is like a little bit like traditional nostalgic maybe in my head where it's like you know what the leotard isn't really the worst look it is a hurdle for new people coming into the sport to get over because they're like, oh, no, I'm not comfortable wearing that. I, I can't put myself out there like that. But what's funny is then these kids are out jumping on the trampoline in their underwear. And they're like, oh, I'll put myself out there wearing just my underwear. But I would never put on a leotard. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. We <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the way to go. I think that it could be, I think, you know, I think the shorts might need to be just a, a hair longer, um, just to have some sort of effect. I think that they could allow more designs in the leotard patterns that are cooler, a little bit more hip. Um, 
even allow the shorts to be colored differently or whatnot. It's not like short shorts aren't in right now. Uh, people are loving the short shorts. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't think that it's necessarily the outfit, but something does need to change, whether there's like a intermission round or like a... Two trick, more two tricks. I love sure. two tricks. Like a two trick round in between. I'm not saying that's the way to go. I'm just saying something that, yeah. that, that breaks up the full monotony because once you watch 120 compulsory routines, obviously you're like, okay. Once you watch 120 optional routines, you're like, okay. Um, you know, it's same thing if you watch five hours of football, eventually you're like, okay. Like I can't, I can no longer even watch the screen anymore. Um, yeah, it's like anything, it gets repetitive. And that's, that's where I kind of, I guess, you know, ruffled some feathers early on because I said, you know, this is a little boring for me. I, I want something a little bit more spicy. I want something where I don't know what I'm about to look at, you know, and that's where we did. We kind of tried this whole freestyle thing to see where that goes. But I like the idea of the traditional side of the sport. I like, I just, I think you need both. I think you really do. I think you need that kind of fun, creative side for those creative people that aren't so analytical and mathematical, but they mm -hmm. can get in. Because right now, unless you're kind of that focus, going to put in the 30 hours a week and it's always going to be bang on, which to be honest, a lot of kids, that's not exactly an easy way to sell a sport to a child. You know, but if we have another more of a developmental, whether it's freestyle or if it's just kind of, you know, recreation, whatever you want to call it, but have a bit more of that sort of a low level entry. I, I think there's a high hurdle to get in just because it's almost like you, you jump in and the only way to get in is you're missing the whole learning passion that you had when you started. A lot of kids are getting right into the competition. I, I think it might, there might be a room for another stream that isn't competition based. It's more just playing based. And I think we're learning that as we go, but I think that's going to be really important in opening up that barrier entry. Yeah. Kind of like an intramural league where it's like, this is you're you know, you're doing it just for fun. You're going yeah. and doing a meetup and it's just for fun and you're going to try some X, Y, Z's, but there's some structure, but not a full like structure. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's at least my theory. But hey, you know, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. And uh, we're going to try to get Hardy Fink on the line in uh, one of our episodes coming up. So we'll see what his thoughts are on all that. But either way, it was great to get your thoughts on the Olympic and to hear your journey. It was very inspiring. I think their audience is going to hopefully kind of get some butterflies in their stomach just thinking about, you know, what it's like to, you know, think about something from since 2000 all the way. And then 2016, 16 years later, you get your dream and that's and that's what it takes and i think a lot of kids don't realize it's a 16 year journey you know and uh, i think it's really cool to hear it right from you and so i thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experience with us yeah thanks for having me well i hope you guys enjoyed and learned a few things there's a big world out there worth exploring and I'm happy to be able to bring these great experiences right to you through this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast and learn something, please share and take a screen grab of our funky cartoons and hashtag GRT certified for a chance to win a shout out to our community. Also, please leave us a review to be part of helping this information get out into the industry. It's much appreciated. Along with these podcasts, we have a large online content hub that we call the GRT Network with many other interviews and full tutorials and written content discussing everything about acrobatics. We will be constantly growing this archive of videos like a cross between Netflix and Wikipedia for anyone in the acrobatic industry. We also have a complete online educational program for athletes of all levels that provides a do-it-yourself pathway to success for any acrobat. Check out our constantly growing library of playlists that will teach you anything from tightening up your social media, to how to get around fear, to even learning all the biology that underlies all your acrobatic skills. We work very hard with our team around the world to provide this exclusive content for you and appreciate any donations made to the FTA to help keep these episodes coming at you. And if you want all the content, become a GRT Network full member to get exclusive content before everyone else and access to special discounts and giveaways through our amazing global partners. Thanks guys, see you next episode.